Hey everyone, geophysicist Stefan Burns here. Earth has been blasted by high frequency radiation increasingly over the past few days from a ton of solar flares on the sun. And we see this sunspot group here becoming bigger and bigger and more and more active. There have been multiple M-class flares. That's the second strongest category of solar flare. And in fact, there are multiple waves of plasma that have launched from the sun that are soon to impact the Earth. NOAA has issued a G2 geomagnetic storm warning for these solar storm impacts. We'll have to wait and see how they impact the Earth, but they have estimated at least three separate coronal mass ejections are inbound. And this sunspot group here, continuing to get bigger and continuing to be very active, poses a radiation storm risk if it flares from the western limb because of how this part of the sun is magnetically connected to the earth and so if there is a big flare from that location even an x-class flare which is possible then we could see a huge increase in relativistic flux these are ions like protons and electrons traveling near the speed of light and they rain down on the earth very quickly and they cause a lot of charging and there has already been quite a lot of activity here on Earth itself. We had a magnitude 6.5 earthquake strike today here near some of the prior activity we've been having near Papua New Guinea. And we also had another strong earthquake in the Drake Passage in this old fault system. It's not the normal zone that you get a lot of high magnitude earthquakes. That would be here along this volcanic arc in that subduction zone. But here we see a 6.3 magnitude earthquake and so this area looks like it's gearing up for something quite large perhaps even larger than the strongest earthquake that ruptured there which is just recently a magnitude 7.5 so a bit of a bump in overall global seismic energy release today to high levels as a result of this combination of the 6.5 and the 6.3 and there have been aftershocks in this location. If we zoom in there, we see magnitude 5.1, 5.0, 4.8, 4.4, and there's also this magnitude 5.1 aftershock in the Drake Passage. Plus there's been, of course, earthquake activity in other locations. We just had a magnitude three earthquake, 3.0 hit Berkeley, which has been seeing some increased earthquake activity in general for the past few weeks, past few months. And so the San Andreas Fault, California, typically is pretty quiet, and that is still the case, but it's certainly overdue. All parts of this fault system are overdue in California. Hopefully nothing happens. Also, Cascadia is gearing up for something at some point quite large, capable of high magnitude 8s and magnitude 9s. And I just look at how we've been having tons of activity here along the Ring of Fire. These faults have been slipping and well, everything eventually does have to balance out. So eventually, if this again, geologic timescale could be 50 years from now. It could be 100 years from now. It could be tomorrow. We are going to be having some big earthquake activity in the United States. But in addition to these big earthquakes and these big solar flares, we have another big coronal hole soon to rotate into geo-affected position. And so the sequence of events is going to be this one, two, three punch from these solar storms hitting Earth. And then we're immediately going to be hit by a coronal hole high-speed stream, which is going to increase the solar wind velocity, drop that solar wind density. And as a result of that, we're very likely to be back in a global earthquake watch because that low solar wind density seems to very much be connected to high magnitude earthquakes. These two earthquakes here today, the 6.5 and the 6.3, popping off right at the end of the earthquake watch that we put out a few days ago on the channel. And Earth's radiation belts have decharged a little bit from the high levels that they were at a few days ago. As you can see, Earth's radiation belts were supercharged. And they were at these super high levels for about a week straight. And then on the 13th and the 14th of October, there was a bit of an ion precipitation event which caused them to decharge. That energy rained down into the planet. It was immediately after that that we had that magnitude 6.5 and 6.3 earthquake. Keep that in mind. But our radiation belts are now at more normal levels. They will undergo a second ion precipitation event when we get these solar storm impacts to come in. We'll have that G1, G2, geomagnetic storm 
perhaps stronger. I think it's probably just going to be G1, G2, but we'll have to wait and see as to the solar wind properties, the solar storms, or specific magnetic field configurations. And then afterwards, the radiation belts will recharge with that new solar plasma, and then we get the high speed stream impact. So that is the current sequence of events that's unfolding right now. And those sunspot groups that have been flaring, they are soon going to be rotating in direction of 3i atlas which we have some new data on now these latest images of interstellar object 3i atlas are not recent this was taken on august 24th of this year by the keck cosmic web imager at a wavelength of 0 0.3425 to 0 0.55 micrometers but this does allow us to see 3i atlas in new light because these wavelengths that they looked at specifically are great for characterizing nickel and also cyanide. And there are differences between the two in terms of how far outgassed those two different compounds are. So here we see a scale bar 6,000 kilometers and we see that there is a higher flux rate for interstellar object 3i atlas right there in the center that does not mean that's the size of the nucleus that's just where the coma is densest this gas dust and plasma but we see that extends out quite a ways at this specific wavelength of light and here's the direction of the sun and we see that's pushing out a little bit more in the summer direction than it is behind in general there's no obvious tail feature that we see which is what a normal comet would have it would probably be stretched out in this anti-sunward direction but instead we're having a little bit more of this coma push out in the sunward direction you can see that bias there very clearly but overall a fairly low resolution look at this intriguing interstellar object which is showing a pretty strong outgassing of nickel and also cyanide and here we have these two comparison graphics for interstellar object 3i atlas on the left we have cyanide on the right we have nickel again we have our sunward direction you see that the envelope of cyanide surrounding this object is quite a bit wider than it is for nickel and as you probably know if you've been watching the channel there's this imbalance in the nickel to iron ratio for 3i atlas unlike basically Anything we've seen in our solar system is quite bizarre. Of course, this is an interstellar object, so it doesn't have to follow the rules and playbook of our solar system. It formed in a completely different, unique environment. But it is anomalous, and that's why the Keck Cosmic Web Imager decided to look at the specific wavelength at interstellar object to better quantify its specific ratios of these compounds. And so we see that cyanide is quite well represented there. It's clearly emitting quite a lot of it and also quite a lot of nickel. We also have new data from the ESA showing Earth's magnetic field and its evolution from 2014 to 2025. And look how the South Atlantic magnetic anomaly has expanded in size. We see that quite clearly it has now started to push out towards South Africa there. And that's quite a large expansion. They estimate that to be about the surface area size of Western Europe. The field strength there dropping during this time frame of 11 years by about 330 nanotesla. Now at the same time, we see the flux lobe over Siberia where the field is strong. We see that that has increased in strength by about 250 nanotesla or so. And then the flux lobe over Canada, also of positive field strength, has decreased by more than 800 nanotesla. So quite a lot of changes to Earth's magnetic field over the past 11 years, but the greatest changes are to this South Atlantic anomaly, this zone of reversed flux. So effectively, there is some sort of magnetic structure deeper within the Earth that is reverse in polarity compared to the normal magnetic field there, causing the field to express at the surface anomalously weak. And until that reverse flux patch gets resolved and somehow integrated or pushed out or something like that, we are going to continue to have this weak spot in Earth's shield. And this is where we get a lot more cosmic radiation to rain in that affects satellites that pass through the area, the International Space Station and astronauts, and any ground-based system. So there's a lot of cosmic information and energy streaming down into South America as a result of this magnetic anomaly. And it's now expanding to the east 
towards Africa, specifically South Africa. So very interesting. We do have the magnetic pole in the southern hemisphere down here. This is the zone of highest field strength on planet Earth. And the magnetic pole is moving ever so slowly westward at about 10 kilometers per second. Meanwhile, up in the northern hemisphere, the magnetic pole up in the Arctic is racing towards Siberia. That is why we think it's moving from Canada to Siberia because this flux lobe has weakened. This one has gone stronger and now it's moving about 40 kilometers per second based off of the latest data. So changes to Earth's magnetic field as well. The magnetic field guides the flow of energy from outer space down to the surface. So as we have these changes unfold, you're going to see changes to things like aurora and also to space weather effects. For example, power grid outages. It's fairly minor what we're seeing here, these changes. This is not indicative of something absolutely cataclysmic about to unfold. But certainly there are normal secular variations that occur to Earth's magnetic field across time. It's not a stable system and we are seeing this unfold in real time. And on that note, we can look at our cosmic ray flux as measured by a neutron monitor. And we see up top our last 24 hours, our neutron flux is flat. Therefore, our cosmic ray flux has effectively been flat. We can see the last 30 days there in the middle. We see this drop that occurred near the end of September, not by much, only by about 2% or so. And it slowly has returned back to baseline. If we go down below, though, we can see our complete data set going from the 1st of April 1964 all the way to today the 16th of October and we see the solar cycle reflected in cosmic ray flux because as the sun undergoes its magnetic flip it becomes more active like with all those solar flares that we've been seeing over the past week that strengthens the heliosphere of the solar system and pushes out these galactic cosmic rays. And then when the sun is in solar minimum, there's very little activity, sunspots are effectively zero, we get more galactic cosmic ray flux. So we see that when it's higher, that is solar minimum. And when the cosmic ray flux is lower, that is solar maximum. We can see where we are relative to past solar cycles. This was solar cycle 24 maximum right there. Cosmic ray flux did not go down that much. Here's solar cycle 23 maximum. This is the early 2000s. And we're at about a level equivalent to that. So there's been a lot of similarities between solar cycle 25 maximum and solar cycle 23 maximum. We see solar cycle 22 really drop the cosmic ray flux quite down. So all of these values are about average as of right now for solar cycle 25 maximum in comparison to the past few solar cycles. So we're receiving less cosmic energy, but more solar energy. And that does seem to have an effect on people individually in terms of their health and their wellness, and also collectively in terms of societal movements and more. And we have a new moon coming up. So here we see our true sky astronomical chart. This is the actual constellations to size in the sky where they are. And we see the different planets and points that we can track. For example, here is the sun. Here is Venus. Here is the moon. And so this is set for today, the 16th of October. We see that the moon right now is in the constellation of Leo. And it will soon go conjunct Venus. So if we go forward uh, one hour we see it just slowly move forward like this it's getting closer to venus if you go forward a day now we're october 17th see how it got closer to venus and we go forward to the 18th now it's nearly conjunct it is conjunct on the 18th and 19th of october and then on the 21st is when we have the new moon with the moon conjunct the sun in the constellation of Virgo and this is a very special new moon because we also have the superior conjunction of 3 eye Atlas occurring at the same time. So if you get the exact time lined up here we see the moon and the sun together. This is going to be the moon out during the day so they're going to be up in the sky at the same time the moon's not going to appear at night it's going to be a dark night as a result in the constellation of virgo and three eye atlas will be on the other side of the sun exactly conjunct that so a very powerful energetic moment coming up with this superior conjunction of three eye atlas combined with this new moon in the constellation of virgo make sure you spend some time for yourself self-care is so so important at this moment in time so spend some time in nature make sure you rest and relax eat good food 
go move your body, exercise, walk, do all the things. That's what I encourage you to do. Here to help you along with that journey to understand what's happening energetically here on Earth and in the cosmos. So please subscribe to the channel if you like these updates. Again, I've been your host, Stefan Burns, wishing each and every single one of you well. Please take care of yourselves, and I'll see you all in the next video.